did, are there questions or do I go sit down now? Or just comments, whatever, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I'll stand. So um, there's a microphone here. If you want to come up and ask questions, by all means, you're welcome. Otherwise, you're also welcome to just raise your hand and then come down. Go ahead and ask. Uh, in the back, I see a hand. <laughs> All right, so here's one of the problems. When I listen to the news, I hear what the Trump administration is doing. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be, I assume that we're all kind of more or less in agreement. <laughs> If not, I'll see you in the parking lot. <laughs> uh, this administration is evil. And um, yes, for a letter word. And my frustration in particular is that I know a lot of what they're doing to disabled, disabled people from the decimation of uh, health care to the extreme weakening of the ADA. I mean, but this doesn't make the news very much or when there's discussion of threats to healthcare, there's very little discussion of the fact that it not just hits disabled people immediately, but that I know people who are dying right now. And I know people who are being forced back into institutions, having finally gotten themselves out. This administration is doing stuff that is so horrible. But because we are not visible enough, because we're not seen as being crucial to our community at whatever level, we don't make the news. Like, you all should just jump on my Facebook feed, um, bring, bring Prozac. Um, <laughs> but this is a horrible time. And yet, even within that horrible time, there are lots of communities that are being so injured that still, not just disabled people, who are still under the radar about what all this means. So that's how I would answer that. More questions, please? Yes, right here. I was wondering, like the most, I was wondering if you could speak to the transition of working as a visual artist for so many years and now doing a memoir. How is that process different? What was it like? What surprised you? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect this to happen. Um, I wrote a, an op-ed for the New York Times, and um, I got a call from an agent. And at the end of my op-ed, they asked for a one-sentence bio, and I said that I was working on a memoir, and this agent calls and says, is this true? And I go, oh my god. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so it ended up selling to Penguin. Um, the kind of, I've always worked collaboratively, the kind of collaboration in writing and in visual art are different. And um, different frustrations. Uh, but when I get a chance to do both things, um, write and paint or draw, I feel very whole. I've always written, but I've written a lot of lectures. And the hardest thing to do was to get out of what I call the drone, the explainy voice and tell a story, because I'm used to doing art history lectures and stuff. And, and so I had to have a teacher act in me um, at one point. <laughs> so that's one big difference. Anyone ever? Yes, right here. Um, looks like part of school was integrated. Um, yes. Can you talk about intersectionality? Uh, and, Absolutely. Uh, Well, Condon was really unusual because Cincinnati in the 60s and 70s, well, Cincinnati period was, I mean, we talk here about things being racially segregated. Cincinnati makes this place look like a bad time ad. Um, and especially when I was growing up, it was black or white, almost no other national communities at all. 
And I remember the first time I saw a woman in a sari, it took until the 90s, and I almost drove off of the sidewalk. Um, I was so happy. But so Condon, because our impairments superseded other forms of identity, Condon was more integrated than almost any other school in the city. And I didn't realize at the time how remarkable that was, that I grew up with friends of both, you know, like I said, it was just black and white at the time. But what that taught me in particular was that my body was part of a continuum. And that this is my problem with mainstreaming, in fact, that these, am I gonna knock this over? There's something undesirable happening here. <laughs> Back away from the um, Sorry about that. Uh, I'm kind of hell on the physical world. Um, that these days, from what I understand, mainstreaming. And I think that this often pertains to badly done integration, is that you'll have an environment where there's a large percentage of one population in terms of disability, mostly kids who are able-bodied, and you'll have two or three kids who have impairments, and they don't develop a group uh, identity. They're not introduced to rights or culture. Um, a lot of times kids will avoid each other because if their identity is heavily stigmatized, the last thing they'll do sometime is to create a coalition because they don't want to be, it, it heightens their visibility as stigmatized. Um, so I feel really lucky to be part of a community, and I don't mean to idealize it, there's a ton of learning that is going on. There's a great article right now about Queer Eye, where there was an African American disabled man who was on Queer Eye a few more, um, weeks back. I didn't see it, but I read the articles. And there were people who misunderstood what was going on with his narrative and said things online that were really unwise and racist because they weren't thinking about the specific experience of black men with disabilities and that it wasn't the same as for white men and that it comes out of different narratives. And so they were reading it as a very uh, sort of a whitewash narrative and there's been really good dialogue around like, okay, here are the problems here. So there's still as much struggle um, around understanding intersectionality and disability, but because we've started from there, because it's always been an awareness that it ties everyone together, I think that in some ways we are farther than a lot of other communities are, or at least it's really, really woven into any serious dialogue. Does that kind of, um, but I, you know, I mean, there's huge work to do constantly. Um, do we have time for another? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay, over here. Yeah, you were talking about I'm sorry, my hearing was not wonderful. If you could be loud. I yell. How's that? Yelling is excellent. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My apologies to the people around you. Um, um, Well, it's true that most of us will end up with impairments. However, that is not the same as living a big part of your life with impairments, where your sense of gender, sexuality, economic um, possibility, educational possibility, uh, is affected at every point in your life. And it's one of the problems with the idea of disability is that when it's tied to aging, it's usually at a point that people are moving away to some extent from full participation in public life, even though often they shouldn't be, but that's been the pressure for people aging anyways that we're supposed to retire. 
I mean, if I hear one more time that a gallery doesn't want to show me because they're only interested in young people, um, I may rethink the ban on assault rifles. But <laughs> 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 I don't think that. Anyway, um, so I guess my first impulse, to some extent, is to shy away from putting everything together and to say, let's look at each specific uh, constellation of issues that the issues for children with disabilities versus teenagers versus people who want to have children versus people who are aging there's a whole swirl of separate things some of which will be the same but much of which uh, is really affected by a specific situation the invisibility of old people um, and the discomfort and rejection of old people in our culture is horrific all by itself. What, what I was really getting at was you mentioned uh, some, uh, a lawyer, or the, the person who started the organization. Mark is not a lawyer, but yes. is very attached to is popular culture. Movies, television. Um, pop culture has, as we saw with queerness, had an enormous effect on the acceptance of queerness in our culture. Um, so I'm, for instance, part of 5050 and 2020, which is an organization founded by Jill Soloway of Transparent that's working towards equal representation of queer, trans, and disabled people and people of color in Hollywood and uh, all that Hollywood does, film and TV and everything. And so partly they're just simply working so that when you turn on the TV or you go to the movies, there's somebody in the story, if not hopefully the star. That's a whole conversation. So partly it's about Media representation, as tedious as that is, it really changes people's ideas. So I remember when curb cuts happened. And I used to joke that it was like the aliens came down and brought back all the disabled people. Because like they could leave their houses, they could go out, they could do stuff. Where I had grown up not seeing anybody. And as soon as people could like cross the street, all of a sudden, the sidewalks were full of people with wheelchairs and crutches. And a lot of it is, how do we make sure that people are just present? Because as soon as people are present, then you have to contend with them. And I did want to say one thing um, about uh, the magic wheelchair thing. Um, it's lovely, and I'm very for it. But I will say one complicating thing about it, which is that people who use wheelchairs, the main discourse that they try and get across is that wheelchairs are wonderful tools. They are, I'm, I did one of the portraits up there was of a woman who um, grew up in a little hill town in Italy where there were no wheelchairs. And she was carried everywhere. And when she was 12, she got her first wheelchair. And she ended up being one of the most important housing activists in America. And she writes really f feelingly about adoring her wheelchair and loving her wheelchair. And I, I, the phrase, for instance, bound to your wheelchair, confined to your wheelchair, which is still used in the news, has to end. We have to look at wheelchairs as empowering devices, 
that are beautiful, that are being redesigned all the time in all kinds of ways that allow people to have lives and autonomy. And so when we think about, let's say, wheelchairs for kids and wheelchairs for you know, people in middle lives and wheelchairs for older people and power wheelchairs and power assist wheelchairs and manual wheelchairs and dance wheelchairs and sports wheelchairs, we should be training ourselves to see these as beautiful, desirable objects that we want to make space for. So I think that that's just one example of how, like if we start with a, an empowering tool, think about how it branches out and how people in different parts of their life are going to use them, you know, that's a place to start. Am I good? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you.